Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast, your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey guys, today's podcast is sponsored by our friends at Global Patties. Global Patties is the family operated business that has been in business for over 17 years, manufacturing protein supplement patties for honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties made with time tested recipe of natural ingredients with or without real pollen, as well as custom patties to meet any specific requests. Feeding your colonies protein supplement patties will help them grow by increasing brood production and increase overall honey flow. Did you know Global invented and made popular the time-saving paper sandwich patty design? This has been copied by others and is now being used universally. So keep your bees going strong all summer long by supplementing with Global Patties. Find out more at their website, www.globalpatties.com. Our listeners also should check out our other sponsor, Wickwas Press. Wickwas is the publisher of quality bee books, including Tammy Horn Potter's Flower Power, Establishing Pollinator Habitat, and Dr. Larry Connor's newest book, Keeping Bees Alive, Sustainable Beekeeping Essentials. Find these books and many other quality books online at www.wickwas.com. You bet. We want to thank our friends at Global Patties and Wickwas Press for sponsoring today's episode. So, Kim, I've been feeding my bees sugar, syrup, and pollen like I had money coming out of my ears. And it's just going crazy. So, how are your bees doing there in Ohio? I know you've had uh, a long spring Well, it finally quit raining, and uh, they're actually doing quite good. I I think I told you I went through nine queens with three colonies this spring, and and, uh, they finally settled down, and the honey flow started, and I don't know, do you know what a BB tree is? And I'm sitting here, and I I don't even have the the genus species, but I got a BB tree growing up. It's three stories tall, right outside, two-story window, and I watch, and, and... it's blooming today, and on a blossom the size of a dinner plate, there'll be twenty bees. Wow! And and it's so they're doing good, and other things are blooming. So I may sac I may I may not have to sacrifice this season. It may work out well for me. There's honey in the hives. Queens seem to be doing good. The weather's not raining. We'll see. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. You know, I grew up there in Ohio. I don't remember what a bb tree is I, oh, I, i've shot invasive. a lot of i've shot a lot of trees with bbs but i've never heard of a bb tree yeah it's an invasive and i actually i got this one from richard taylor about 30 years ago uh when i was still living in connecticut and and uh uh it is an incredibly attractive plant you have to have a male and a female to get seedlings i only have uh, a male so i don't get seedlings popping up all over my yard but it's a uh, it's a nice tree. Bees love it, and hence the name, BB tree. How, how come? All, how come it's all the invasive species that are best nectar producers? There's a rule, I think, um, <laughs> and, and <laughs> uh, it, it seems like that. What's the one uh, down south right now? Tupelo is the Tupelo. one they're trying to get rid of, and and that too is a, a heck of a honey plant, but it's an invasive, and some people out there are are growling because they're trying to get rid of it. So. So I'm looking forward to today's guest. Um, I've uh, read, uh, uh, actually in the process of reading one of Tammy's books, uh, The Bees, uh, the, Bees the History of the Honey Bee in America. I probably have butchered the title, but we can. she can correct me here in a little bit. And uh, you go back with Tammy a little bit, don't you? Yeah, we go back to, uh, oh, not quite 20 years when she was working on her first book. She came up to the uh, library here at Bee Culture, and she spent a few days looking at some of our older tomes and looking at some of the old photos we had. Uh, that's when I first met her, and and we've kept kept touch ever since. Fantastic. Well, let's uh, get her on uh, Zoom right now, and uh, let's uh, start talking to her. Hey, Tammy, uh, welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast. Thanks for having me. You bet. Tammy, it's good to have you with us today. And uh, Jeff and I were just talking about some of the plants that are blooming. And 
Uh, there's a reason beekeepers talk about plants, of course, but I'm sitting here holding a copy of your newest book called Flower Power, Establishing Pollinator Habitat. So um, I like I like how those two things came together. Appreciate that. Thank you for having me on the show. And of course, being a, a child of the 60s, I cannot help but comment on the title um, uh, I have been I have been to the places that flower power was popular in the sixties and and I I <laughs> I have good memories. I was going to say, can you remember them? <laughs> I'm not going there, Jeff. <laughs> uh, but I like the title. The first when I first heard about your book, I liked the title. I said, "This is a beekeeper's book. It's got to be a beekeeper's book." And and. Uh, I think you picked the right one. I'm looking at a, at a at the cover. It's covered with blossoms and bees. And I have to ask, uh, with all of your background, you've got a lot of background in dealing with pollinator habitat. Um, and uh, But I want to go back. I'd like you to go back a little bit further to tell us how you got there. Mm. Well, <clears throat> so I, ch- I chose Flower Power as the title for this particular book. Because I was wanting to highlight the possibilities of many of the areas that our, our our energy companies have access to, you know, surface mine sites, um, Columbia Gas has been working to uh, take some of their rights of way and convert those to pollinator habitat. Solar panels all over the United States are considering this. So the power there in that title is kind of referring to how we get our energy in the United States, as well as providing fuel for the bees. So um, that's very clever. I hadn't, I hadn't oh. conne- made that connection. That's very clever. <laughs> well, you, you are from the sixties, so I'll, I'll give you that one. <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna judge on that one, but, um, <laughs> but, but it's, uh, to me, I did not know this when I was in your office back in 2002, pouring over those photographs that you had re- rescued from a dumpster, and I was writing Bees in America, How the Honeybee Shaped a Nation. That, that was the first book. But I guess back in 2002, I embarked on this journey of creating the first bee trilogy, and that became the past, present, and future, the way that I see it. Uh, of of honeybees in the United States. So bees in America is obviously the past. And economy, uh, what women and bees can teach us about global markets, that's the present with the influx of so many women beekeepers. And then flower power sort of naturally turned into the future. And that's, uh, it's not quite as lucrative as the Star Wars trilogy, but that's <laughs> how I see the three... If if there's a method to the madness, that's the way it has unfolded. Well, that's a. Uh, I want to go back. I want to get back to that because that's that's where we're going to end up today, talking about not only the trilogy but the 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 the, the newest book itself. But uh, when I said, "How did you get here?" I want you to go back a little bit further to grandfather. Oh my goodness. Okay. So you really, okay. So back way, <laughs> way back. How's, how's the trilogy start? Long, oh long goodness. ago in a galaxy far, far away. We want to go back that far. <laughs> See, um, so when I started helping my granddad, I would, had just finished defending my dissertation. I was determined never to do. And what, what was your dissertation then? I'm sorry, oh, your dissertation? English English literature, mm-hmm. as, as, I, as I was saying, I was determined never to do math, science, or agriculture. And, and, uh, and those aren't ranked. I hated them all equally. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, when I went to college, um, I was proud of myself that I managed to graduate four years of college without having to have a math class. Um, and so... So when my grandfather asked me to come help him, this, this, it was, it was 1997. It was May, the month of May. And, um, and it was, I I was very clear with him. I was like, okay, old man, I will help you one day. 
in one day with these bees. That's it. Um, I had grown up on a farm raising pigs, and I was convinced that I didn't know what these beehives entailed, but it had to, it, it surely had to involve, you know, nasty smelling critters and, <laughs> and, so, um, and of course, obviously with honeybees, you, you just had to factor in that you, that you were going to get stung. Um, and so, you know, so on that first day uh, that we worked hives, uh, it was anything but that. And my grandfather's personality, it, it changed immediately as soon as we started uh, preparing to, to work the bees. Uh, you know, my grandfather had been a medic in the South Pacific. And uh, he brought a certain type of militant uh, approach to most things in his farming operation, as you need to do if you were going to succeed as a as a farmer. And uh, so, so whenever he started working as honeybees, uh, his voice softened. Uh, he became he became a gentler person in the best sense of the word. And so. Um, I, I ended up helping him the rest of the summer. Uh, I changed my entire plans. I, um, you know, uh, this is more information than I'm sure your listeners will care to hear, but I was in a romantic, uh, relationship and, and I had to call that person and say, I'm so sorry. I'm staying here in Kentucky, helping my grandfather work bees. And, <laughs> and, uh, so that's how it started. And and I never regretted, uh, you know, it was just, it was an, a, a doorway that opened and I just kept walking through. Not an uncommon story, uh, but it's always nice to hear it again. Sure. Uh, yes. Um, well, that got, that got you into the world and, and you've talked about your, um, uh, that the first two books that you've done. And, and uh, Jeff, I'm going to interject here that Cammy is one of our guests at uh, the History of American Beekeeping come up here in Medina in October. She's going to be talking about, well, I'm not sure what she's going to be talking about, the past and the future, the past, the present, and the future of beekeeping in America, I guess, is probably uh, a, a nice round out. So if you happen to be in Medina in October, look us up and you can, you can uh, catch Tammy uh, talking about what she knows best. So, so the flower power. Now that I know that there's a deeper meaning to the title, <laughs> uh, I, I, I have to. I'm a horticulturist, so I, I looked at your book with those eyes, and I'm looking at the plants that you were talking about, and I'm looking at how to use them, and I'm looking at your bee biology, and it was a perfect. It was that was a perfect story. Looking at it the way I did, you were looking at it at, at uh, as the third the third chapter of, of your trilogy, but you started with coal mines dealing with this subject. And you tell, tell us a little bit about that. I've never, I can't imagine what that must have been like. So uh, I should probably clarify when I wrote bees in America, I, I was still a horrible beekeeper. In fact, I say that on the very front page of Bees in America, that if, if you're looking for a how-to book, the, Bees in America is not that. I, I was approaching it still from a very much, I was, a, I was an English professor. I was looking at a, a beekeeping as a cultural study. Um, at that point in time, I was much more interested in beekeepers, you know, perhaps than the actual you know, maintenance of honeybee hives. I think that's fair to say. Um, but in 2006, I tell people, I, uh, I was the National Endowment of Humanities of Appalachian Studies at a liberal arts college. And as part of that NEH chairpersonship, uh, I was expected to do a research project. And so it seemed to me that... Uh, you know, I, I knew people in the coal industry in eastern Kentucky, and the nature, the technology of coal mining had changed. Um, you know, the deep mines that were four feet, um, those were gone. 
And, uh, and so they had moved to a type of mining called surface mining. So coal companies, when they do surface mining, they're required to reclaim. And what had become a pattern since the surface mining law was passed in 1977 was for coal companies to use invasive species because they grow quickly and they fix the ground quickly. Um, two common concerns are flooding and erosion. And so it seemed to me uh, at the time I was a professor, I was the NEH chair of Appalachian Studies, uh, it seemed like an opportune time to see if they would be interested in diversifying their planting mix uh, with pollinator habitat. That was right about the time that colony collapse disorder started making headways and uh, media headlines. And so I was just fortunate that coal companies were willing to consider that, that opportunity. And so that became then the basis of flower power. Um, you know, that particular book is when Larry Connor and I first started talking about it, uh, he thought it would be about a 40 page primer, um, what to do, what not to do things that were challenges that, you know, just things that people may not realize how, in terms of how to go about that project. Um, but, but it also became much more than that as I started writing it. I got, I got to believe that coal companies looked at this and said, um, you want us to do what? And it's going to cost us how much? Uh, so you must have you must have approached them with something financial that was attractive. So coal companies have to put up what they call bond money. Uh, and and what was attractive to them, they don't they don't some of these bond monies can be up to a million dollars. So if they can show that their reclamation efforts are growing more quickly then that bond money is returned. And so federal inspectors come onto surface mine sites and they grade how well uh, the reclamation plantings are doing. Some years they grow really well, but some years we have droughts or flooding or things like that. And so they don't grow, grow quite so well. But, you know, I guess my pitch to the coal companies was if you have pollinators on your surface mine sites, then you have a, a ready vector of seed source right there. And you also have a tool that you can use to uh, work with the community and set up economic development uh, on some of these surface mine sites so that they become teaching sites as well. So there were a couple of different things that, they, that coal company executives liked about, A, diversifying the reclamation plants, and B, maintaining and hosting hives and apiaries on their surface mine sites because it altered how the community saw these surface mine sites. Interesting. I would, I would, have, I would have not, uh, well, I'd, obviously I didn't think of it, think it through that far. So that was, that was a pretty, uh, well, I'm going to say a bold program, but certainly a well thought out program from your perspective and the people who are putting beehives on those mine sites now how did that work out so i was the person putting the hives on the mine site <laughs> <laughs> you know to the extent that i had a salary uh i i think i made about two dollars an hour for <laughs> a good six years <laughs> i mean good for a beekeeper yeah, I know. I mean, <laughs> but I really, I, I just, for, for, you know, from 2008, when we moved our first mine site uh, hives onto the surface mine sites until 2014, when I was invited to be the Kentucky State Apiarist, I, I loved every day of it. It was the most compelling chapter of my life until I got married. Um, and and it was a it was an education into um it was an education not into just beekeeping but working with people and understanding where limits are and and how to how to negotiate i think um if i had tried to do this this is an important point actually 
because the coal industry has always been portrayed and perceived as, you know, just a, just a very difficult industry to work with. And if I had tried to do this 30 years ago, I don't think it would have worked. I mean, this is a time when, you know, the industry was, was rebuffing any efforts by the EPA uh, to do any kind of environmental uh, protection agency measures. Um, the rivers were burning, you know, in, in your neck of the woods in Pittsburgh. Um, but Clearly. 30 years down the road, you know, you had a whole generation of, of ex- coal company executives who were farmers, who were hunters, who had benefited from these federal measures and who had a good understanding of why pollinators are important. And so to me, the timing was right. I mean, I just happened to be the right, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Um, Is your model being pursued in other states? I, I know Southern Ohio and Southeast Ohio has a lot of reclaimed Mm-hmm. Uh, lands and and I think um, Western West Virginia does too the whole region. So is that is your model being um, copied and and used? So I think West Virginia is the one that's the most visible right now uh, because uh, I think it's Appalachian Headwaters had received uh, they had settled a lawsuit. Uh, slightly different approach, I would say. Um, they are working directly with uh, unemployed minors, whereas in my case, uh, with with the project I started, it was called Coal Country Bee Works. Um, I was putting hives on active surface mine sites, so there were a lot of liabilities. Um, you know, these active blasting was going off a mile away, for instance. Uh, so, you know, so there were issues there, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, and, and, and the coal industry had not flatlined at that point, uh, in 2008. Um, so, so it was still a very viable industry in Eastern Kentucky. Um, so, so there are some differences between how I approached, um, you know, working with coal companies. I I, I wanted to be very much included in active reclamation, um, Appalachian Headwaters in West Virginia is working with what I would call post-mine land use. Uh, These are areas that have already been mined. Uh, Federal inspectors have already signed off on. Um, That's the clearest difference I see between the two. But the effort is the same here. It's just to help beekeepers, um, you know, gain education and become better beekeepers and provide a better environment for hives. Are, are those well, pro- are those sorry, Kim? Are, are those lands are those lands available for all beekeepers, or just for for the state to use for the beekeeping? Depends. It very much depends. Um, so so uh, I think Kentucky mines uh, tend to be a little bit larger, and and um, than safe is. Pennsylvania mines. Pennsylvania mines are, are much smaller areas of land. What the typical acreage for for a coal company in eastern Kentucky was three thousand acres, four thousand acres. Oh. But in Pennsylvania, by contrast, you know you're looking at three hundred acres. And in West Virginia, that changes a little bit because you have a lot more family members that own a piece of land. And so if the coal company leases that land, then you have more family members involved. In in Eastern Kentucky, uh, some coal companies create banks by which they use to just buy the land outright and then hold on to it after federal inspectors have approved of reclamation. So that land doesn't get turned back over to families. The coal company owns it. So it's a very, you know, it's, it's not a cookie cutter formula. Um, and so some of these lands are not available to the public because they're privately owned by coal companies. Some land will return back to families. It, it just depends, I guess, is the answer. It's complicated. Isn't that what yeah. we say on Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> it is complicated. 
You had an interesting observation or a, a description of what an acre is. What's your what's your common definition or a photo, picture for people who do, can't visualize an acre? Oh, it's a it's about this. It's a little bit larger than a football field. And, and, and I thought it was important to begin flower power that way, because I think most of our society has has become totally removed from agricultural language. And and most of our society has become saturated with sports. So that, to me, was the one point of reference that I could use <laughs> to get across what a surface mine site would look like. You know, when we're talking 3,000 acres, you know, you have to think, okay, 3,000 football fields. Including the end zones. Including the end zones and the market <laughs> band. And <laughs> yeah. Well, that, no, that's really descriptive. I mean, you, you, I've not seen it described that way, and I think that's really visual and and works for a lot of people. Oh, it's an important point of reference for when you're having these talks about pesticides, too, uh, because I have to talk about mosquito spraying programs. And I, and I like to remind folks, at least in terms of the Kentucky Department of Agriculture, that when we use a product called Duet, it's about a teaspoon an acre, you know, which is a football field. And just to give them some some sense of of how dispersed it is, um, because they don't know. And so, if you say an acre, as far as they're concerned, it's their little postage stamp of a yard, or can be in in their minds. Okay. So the 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 next step in what you were doing then was to show that that these lands could be used not only for invasives, but for native plants, and in some cases anyway, um, uh, useful to beekeepers. Did that, did that ever materialize to any scale, useful to beekeepers? So absolutely. I mean, we had, we had a, a, a lot of workshops on all of the surface mine sites that I had apiaries. We had kids on surface mine sites. We had workshop. We had queen production workshops every single Every single season, uh, we had people out um, on, on these sites. Um, of course, we had permission. We had waivers uh, written. Um, that was the good thing. And I, maybe I didn't really uh, discuss this in flower power um, as much as I should have. But that was the real advantage with working with a university uh, was that we were able to to get the liability reduced because uh, we were working with a university. Um, and I'm not sure how you do that if you were to just be the average person walking on the street trying to do something similar. Because bees and coal both have liabilities. And, and yes. you have to understand that and you have to respect that when you, when you begin to do something like this. Um, you know, in fact, now that I'm at the state apiarist and I'm working with Columbia Natural Gas, of course, natural gas has liabilities. Um, and so, you know, one, I think one reality check for anyone who wants to do something like this is to, is to understand that the companies that have stakeholders have to, have to, you know, there are real issues there. Uh, if they have to answer to the public service commission, um, you know, it may take a while, and that's just part of the process. It, you know, a no doesn't mean no forever. Uh, you know, that's that's one of the things I've learned. Hmm. That's a good lesson, um, and hard to learn. I'm going to guess. Oh, sure, because when you first start this, you want to put hives on every piece of bare property you can, and it's and it's you take it personally if somebody says no. You know, how could they not embrace your vision of having hives everywhere? Well. It, you know, when you realize that you could have people who are allergic, who could die, it, you, it gives you pause. So long-term, bigger picture here. Um, this goes, you started this long enough ago that probably you've been able to see some cultural changes in oh, sure. the people who live there in terms of going from working underground all day to becoming a farmer for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, you know, what I see happening in the coal industry is that it's, it's actually transforming into a reclamation industry. 
you know, there are opportunities to get rid of invasives uh, like bush honeysuckle. Um, there are opportunities to go back to some of these sites that we call legacy sites that were compacted to the point that now uh, they, the only species that they can host are invasive species. So, you know, there are opportunities to go back and reforest these places. Um, there's starting to be a whole science on that. Um, you know, I'm, um, you know, cautiously optimistic that, you know, we'll begin to, to, to focus on what I call the, the, it's not just the blue collar vocational aspects of beekeeping, but the knowledge based sciences where we get queen producers, where we get researchers, um, who want to, to work with some of the things that we're having, the viruses that our bees are suffering from. Uh, but those are long-term goals uh, where we're focusing on knowledge. Is this part of what, what you introduce in, in the, the Flower Power book you talk about, or you at least introduce the topic of uh, the forest-based beekeeping initiative? I, I, I think I did. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to, let me say it that way. Sometimes when a writer starts, you know, uh, we, we think that we do something. I don't know if we accomplish it or not. You know, it's only, uh, you know, and when you're in the middle of finishing it, you know, by then you're sleep deprived and, you know, you're <laughs> incoherent and <laughs> you don't know what you've written. There's no distance, but, but it's <laughs> what I had wanted to do. I'll say it that way. Well, that's yeah. You did you did introduce the topic of forest based beekeeping initiative, which I thought was interesting. And I hadn't gotten beyond beyond the introduction or just at least the first three or four sentences in that. Is that something you could speak to right now? Well, it's it's not a new idea at all. Of course, I mean the the, the you know the Scandinavians had a saying that the the, the forests are the mantle for the poor, and mm -hmm. you know one of the things that I am hopeful for uh, in Eastern Kentucky, which has incredibly high rates of poverty, is that we can focus on um, developing forest as a reservoir, maybe as a natural preservation area for pollinators uh, in our country. Because <clears throat> if you look around at the United States, you know, industrial ag um, is, is entrenched in other parts mm -hmm. of the state. And so it seems to me uh, that forest-based beekeeping can can address some of the shortages we have. We don't have a lot of industrial chemicals um, in our area of the country, and so I think it makes for a healthy environment for honeybees um, and trees. But trees have been providing um, shelter, habitat, forage, nectar, pollen for bees. You know, since the Russians were keeping records back in a thousand A.D. and 800. Ireland has its British, um, has its Brett laws. Uh, so it's not a new concept. I, I want to be clear about that. It's not mm -hmm. as if this is an, an original concept at all. But the nature of forestry has changed. And yeah. um, one of the things that um, there's a nonprofit that I'm a board member of, it's called the um, Green Forest Works. Uh, we've been very instrumental in trying to get uh, trees put back on surface mine sites um, so that, again, we, that, that we set up a second industry then that's not just based on coal, but it's based on timber. And it's based on, like I said, beekeeping. We, we import beeswax from Africa for our cosmetic industry, for instance. It seems to me like we can do you know, we can provide that beeswax from the Appalachian region and it be just as good quality. It's now a lot unlike what AI Root was doing here. Just briefly, he planted his queen, he, he established his queen rearing yards and he planted. Uh, 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 basswood. Basswood. Thank you. Trees. Right? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the trees, provided shade when they were young and they provided nectar when they got older and they provided timber when they were mature. And that sounds uh, somewhat what you are doing there, which makes lots of sense. Sure. And, you know, we, we import over 400 million pounds of honey uh, from all over the world. And so, uh, you know, what I would like to see is that the, 
is that the Appalachian region uh, began to, to, you know, produce much more honey uh, so that we don't have to import uh, as many pounds of honey to the United States. Well, just briefly, Tammy, <clears throat> excuse me, what are some of the trees that you're talking about that do well in this sort of a, in this climate and with this soil uh, uh, challenges? So I just received my pollen report uh, from, from Vaughn Bryant. And what I'm seeing in the 2019 pollen report, uh, this is a, 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 a basically Vaughn Bryant at Texas a and and analyzes the honey that I send. And I sent him two samples. I sent a sample from the bluegrass region, which is where most of my hives are. But I also sent a sample from Eastern Kentucky because I have another farm that I have hives at too. And so ash, the, the tree ash showed up, which I don't even write about in Flower Power. Um, but tulip poplar is represented. Um, maple, red maple, uh, always is uh, it all it I guess I've had Brian analyze my honey now since 2012 and that's been the perennial um you know that shows up dogwood has shown up um you know some uh, one horse chestnut is another tree that shows up on a reliable basis um so those are some of the trees um black love <laughs> Less oak. Uh, these are trees that you've planted? No. Oh, no. No, no. These are trees oh, okay. that are already existing on the farm, have been uh, for a long time. Hmm. Um, I, uh, we've, some of these sites that I work with with Green Forest Works have American chestnuts. So, some, so one of my pollen reports showed that one year. Um, so it's been a variety. And every year, of course, your honey changes because – you know, the bees are responding to the environmental cues, uh, but, but those are the regulars. Yeah, I know the environmental thing. It rained here for 30 days and 30 nights of spring, so I'm, I'm, I'm real familiar with responding to the environment um, this year anyway. Uh, Tammy, one of the, one of the uh, chapters in your book is called Challenges. And um, if you've been associated with beekeeping more than about 20 minutes, you know there's always challenges associated with keeping bees. What are some of the challenges that you were looking at in flower power? I, I start with bears because bears <laughs> have made a comeback in eastern Kentucky. And, you know, different states deal with bears you know, in remarkably different ways. Um, you know, in some states like Eastern Kentucky, you're not allowed to, to you're not allowed to shoot a bear unless it's self-defense. Uh, I think West Virginia, you can get a permit to deal with bears. Um, the easiest way, it seems to me, for a beekeeper to deal with bears is to get a fence up, to, to have a fence up before a hive is placed in a site. If you try to do it the opposite way, if you try to build a fence after a bear has discovered where your hive is you're wasting time and money you can't build a you, you cannot build a fence high enough um but this that the bears are closely followed by thieves you know every single year uh, i had hives stolen and i suspect that i probably know the thief uh, i suspect that it's probably somebody whose own hives had died through the course of the winter um, but that's been a, and, and of course, I don't take it personally. I mean, there are beekeepers who have hives stolen in California and Texas and, you know, their losses are, are much greater than mine. But that was a, a perennial problem as well. And that goes back, you know, I mean, I think in Egypt, they hired archers to stand <laughs> by the hives <laughs> because they didn't want their hives stolen, even though those, you know, they were in tubes, round, you know, cylinder, you know, clay cylinders. So, uh, yeah. So this goes back. And so I, 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 I quit taking it personally, but it's still, that's a tough one. You know, that, that's a bruise that is still there. <laughs> And I have no answers to that except, yeah, that I don't, that's it. except I don't want somebody walking into this without realizing that that is they they will have to deal with that issue and the, and then to pour more salt on that wound, you can't get insurance 
for theft. You know, I mean, that's not something that's covered in an insurance policy. So not only have I lost my bees, I can't even, I can't even get those back. You know, there's no insurance policy that I could take out as a beekeeper. So <laughs> yeah, that was a tough one. Oh, for two on that one. What a, that's a, <laughs> it's got to be a frustrating experience. Um, and and I'm, I'm going to go back to, I started with trees. What kind of trees are you looking at? But a lot of what you talk about here are the plants that you were putting in, mm-hmm. uh, in, in um, these, on these um, reclamation fields. And if, <clears throat> if I were in Ohio and I was looking to make some, not a not a, reclam- a a mine reclamation project, but Ohio, Southern Ohio, mm-hmm. which is going to be similar, at least environmental. The climate's going to be similar, and what soil there is is going to be similar. If you were going to make a recommendation, and I'm 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 assuming here that that you were looking at this from I want something blooming uh, as early in the spring as possible after the last frost, and as late as possible until the first frost. Uh, in the fall, I don't even, do you have frost there? Oh, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) In October. If you were, if you were looking to make some sort of um, off the top of your head, you know, uh, recommendation, how would you talk to somebody in in planning something like this? Oh, so I tell people, I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's trees or whether it's flowering species like Forbes, you have to do the work to plant, to prepare the soil first. Otherwise you're just wasting time and money. And so that's hard for people to hear. I mean, so what I mean by that is that, you know, you have to kill that existing vegetation first. And that typically in your area and mine, that typically is going to require a three season herbicide kill, which just turns people off right off the bat, unless they have large acreages and they can do a prescribed burn. But but for my area, what that means is that they have to apply an herbicide now, the first week of August, and then they have to do one before the first killing frost, which is the you know, October 15, we'll say. And then they have to follow that up um, in spring and kill whatever comes up after, you know, after the winter. And, you know, the, the seed companies I work with would prefer a fourth kill. Uh, distillery companies are really difficult. You know, they want things blooming because they have a good deal of tourists. Um, and so it's, it's difficult for them to kind of sit and look at this dead vegetation in very <laughs> visible areas. Um, but, but you're wasting your time. And, and here's the other thing I would tell somebody. I went into this not having a hort background or a botany background or a biology background. <laughs> I'm not proud of this. But, but one of the things that I am seeing happen and learned through the process is that, you know, seeds have their own personalities. So, for instance, sourwood, I had this dream of being able to plant, you know, rows of sourwood, plantation style, nice linear, you know, like little soldiers all over these surface mine sites. Sourwoods don't grow that way. (laughs) They, They like to spread their seeds themselves. And, and if you do try to force that methodology, then they end up not doing well, for one thing. They do not do well as transplants. And then the deer come along and eat what, what, rem- what remains, or the elk, you know. And, and so then finally what I started doing was just gathering the seed of sourwood by hand and spreading that. And that had a much greater success rate immediately. I mean, it was night and day. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, a, it's a cliche to say not all species are the same. It is a very difficult thing to have to learn that. <laughs> there's, a, there's a saying that goes with that. It covers a lot of bases, but, but you certainly have uh, uh, focused on one of the Mother Nature Bats last. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. 
And she, it sounds like she did there. Sure. But, you know, I, that, that's why I wrote flower power, you know, so that maybe somebody doesn't have to make the mistakes I, I had to learn. Um, maybe we shorten that, that, um, span, uh, for folks. Um, and, and people just absolutely uh, despise the term herbicide. But for me, anyway, it's a tool. It's, it's a tool just the same way that my smoker is a tool. And, you know, people use a smoker like it's a weapon and see it as a weapon, you know, and they get sparks flying out of the smoker and they make their bees mad and their <laughs> bees bounce all over the place. But it's really a tool if you know how to use it properly. Um, and, and so is an herbicide. If it's used the right way, um, it can, it can certainly help as uh, a beekeeper tries to convert a piece of land that maybe has been in grass for a long time and, and, or trees. Um, it's the same prep though. That's what I have learned. A peaceful force for the greater good, I guess, something like that. Sure. sure. Mm -hmm. And it's expensive. The other thing they need to know is that it's expensive. Flower seed is not cheap, especially compared to grass seed. Yes. All the more reason to take. I, I tell people to budget a year and a half in terms of conversion. You know, just budget that time and understand that it's going to be butt ugly for a year and a half <laughs> <laughs> and that they need to budget about a thousand bucks an acre and wow. and just understand what that means um so because you you know i, I and i'm and i'm one of those people I, I i know the audience to whom i'm pitching this to uh you want to think okay i don't have time to go back to college and get a horticulture degree or an agriculture degree but i but anybody can plant flowers right i mean that's the thinking and and it's it's more than that it takes time to do it right our pollinator gardens here at the root company we've got uh i'm i'm going to say maybe an acre all told uh planted in a, a whole variety of gardens and your year and a half of but ugly is about right <laughs> uh, we have tried several ways of getting rid of grass, black plastic, and herbicides. Herbicides are definitely more predictable uh, and, and not the first choice, but uh, often the best choice because of the economics of scale, the economics of time, the economics of people and space. So sure. uh, I understand where you're coming from, and I, I don't have any problems with approaching this the way that you did when you're looking at the obstacles you had to overcome making this. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> uh, and I am uh, knowing and, uh, I have, I have, I, I, when you first started this and you were talking about reclamation coal mines, I, I had visions of moonscaped, uh, yeah, you know, sure. and, 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 and how can you possibly make that work? And then you ended up making it work. So. Oh, it's a team approach though. I mean, there are a lot of good people behind this. I just happen to be the beekeeper. Um, you know, I get other, when I'm talking to audiences about this, you know, the same thing. I mean, people want to try cardboard, you know, people want to try goats. They want to bring goats in to kill the vegetation. I mean, you know, goats simply are not, pri if, if you can do goats, that's great. It's not as if I'm saying that that's a lost cause, but, but at some point you're going to have to deal with that seed bank existing underneath the grass, yeah. you know, and, and no one ever sees that. We don't know about it. No one talks about it. That's where you have to build in that, that, you know, that year and a half. And it's as much about educating yourself as it is the, the killing that existing grass. Um, so like I said, I, I'm hope I'm hopeful that this, book can help some people they won't have to make the same mistakes i mean but i loved making them you know i just want to be clear about that i had a lot of fun <laughs> it was difficult but um you know when larry first approached me i thought my goodness and then i kind of thought maybe it could help people 
you know, if they knew uh, how, how much time it takes. Well, horticulture written by a beekeeper is, um, I found it, I found it easy to read because I approach this from a horticulture perspective and you hit all the high points, right? And uh, follow, follow steps one through 34 and you'll get it right. All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one through 34 and a year and a half. And a year and a half, yeah. <laughs> and a few goats. All yeah. right. Prescribed fires. <laughs> In Seattle, they have, there's uh, one or two companies that rent goats for clearing land. Right. It's uh, another another avenue for uh, goat people. So, well, so that's another, it, that's a different podcast. So, <laughs> so there are some folks that are you know wanting to work with the Kentucky Department of Transportation to to bring in goats to manage highway rights of way. Yeah. Um, you know the problem is that we have a very famous goat. His name is Houdini, and Houdini get he is he is been hit by more cars and survived I, I you know you can look houdini up online um but it, you know of course that, there's a, those are major problems for traffic and and safety issues it's uh, it sounds good but uh in reality it's uh less than perfect yeah sure. you're exactly right one of the things i was thinking about is being the state apiary inspector uh for kentucky and and um, how is that working for you in terms of in terms of dealing with with commercial and sideline and hobby beekeepers all over? Mm -hmm. So, for me, it was almost a seamless transition from 2014 when I was working with surface mine companies to kind of covering the entire state uh, because coal exists throughout the entire state. Um, so, so in that sense. Um, we just tried to take what we were doing on surface mine sites and make sure that, you know, the western part of the state was trying to do these things. So that was kind of, uh, like I said, that was quite seamless. Um, in terms of the challenges to being the state apiarist, though, um, big thing, you know, I'm one apiarist for 120 counties. And that can be <laughs> difficult. Um, it's a time, you know, you can't do time travel. Um, but it's been, uh, to me, uh, I didn't know I would, I would like being a state apiarist as much as I have. And so the grant writing, that transferred. Uh, we just finished getting a grant to set up a honey testing analysis lab so I don't have to send my pollen sample, uh, my honey samples to Vaughn Bryant. Um, we have little be open in Lexington. Um, we were able to hire somebody to do, to just focus on, uh, it's called the Kentucky Certified Honey Program because we're trying to get a handle on how much mislabeled honey is around our state. Um, as you can imagine, that's had some, some, some pushback, but it's overall, it's gone over really well. And for me anyway, as the state apiarist, by creating that position and getting funds to hire somebody to do that full time, I'm handing that honey problem off to somebody else so that I can, I can work with beekeepers and I can work with hive health because that to me is my priority. Yeah. But, but it's been, Good. you know, the honey has been a distraction. There's no denying that because <laughs> when people find mislabeled honey, you know, their first inclination is to call me, you know, they want to, you know, I'm the face of the beekeeping industry. And so, um, so getting uh, Sarah Preston hired as the manager of the Kentucky Certified Honey Program, that's been nice. So we're working on that. We started a Kentucky Queen Bee Breeders Association in our state, working very closely with Purdue University. So the idea here is just to kind of you know, we have queen production, bee honey production, um, you know, just trying to kind of keep things moving and progressing. I feel like our state has been behind uh, for a century and we're trying to catch up. Jeff, I was at the Apiary Inspectors of America meeting last uh, January. And one of the things that I noticed sitting in the back of the room was the fact that uh, the gender mix in the room was definitely 
uh, not evenly divided. And there were a lot more women in that room than men. I didn't do a head count, but uh, it was obvious. Recently, I was talking to uh, people in the veterinarian industry in this country, and the veterinarians in this country are running about 60% female and climbing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so Tammy's a part of a growing uh, consensus of, of female state apiary inspectors. And in fact, we've been talking to them about getting them together to do one of these shows. So maybe we can get you back, Tammy, uh, to talk a little more about issues with and, and rewards of being the state apiary inspector um, down the road a little bit. Sure. Well, we got three of them there in a row. We have the Barb there in Ohio. We have uh, Tammy in Kentucky and Jennifer in uh, Tennessee. Yep. Yep. And 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 a lot more. <laughs> Civil, Civil and Maryland. Uh, yeah, yeah, there are. There's the three that's been on the Beekeeping Today podcast. So, not that we're counting. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tammy, thank you. I want to thank you for being here today, sure. talking about flower power. Uh, for those of you listening in, the book is available on Amazon and from Wickwas Press, and hopefully soon from Bee Culture Magazine's uh, bookshelf. And and <clears throat> bookstores near you, you can get it. Uh, Tammy again will be at the October event here at Bee Culture Magazine in Medina. And any any last thoughts, Tammy? No, thank you. I appreciate being on your show. Really cool. I'm glad that uh, we were able to get you on such short notice and and uh, the great information that you're providing and and all your books. And I'm looking forward to uh, continuing to read. Uh, the first book and then catching up on flower power. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a very different person. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's good. I, and, and, it's not, and, uh, it's not I like, like the, the trilogy. same book over and over and over again. I'm, I, I will say that for it. That's right. It's not the same uh, protagonist in each novel. Right? It's not but, a bonus ripper, you know, narrative. <laughs> at all. It's not the same book. <laughs> Just, well, and on that note, <laughs> Tam <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Dr. Tammy Horn Potter, we appreciate you being on Beekeeping Today podcast and, and look forward to having you back with any updates and uh, to future releases of your books. Thanks okay. a lot. Thank you. We'll see you Thank in October, you. Tammy. We'll be there. Looking forward okay. to it. Bye bye. Bye. Well, I really enjoyed meeting Tammy and, and talking to her about her books and, and what she's doing in, there in Kentucky. I'm Growing up in Ohio, I've spent uh, my share of time and reclaimed properties and reclaimed lands in southern Ohio. And, and um, you know, to see that she's so involved in and in, in making those reclaimed properties better and, and, in fact, using bees in the process is, is quite fun. I enjoyed listening to her talk and telling her story. Yeah, it was good. We kind of sprung her on you, Jeff. Uh I saw the book and suddenly uh, it, it sounded like a good idea. And I contacted her and she said, well, um, great, except I leave tomorrow for three weeks. Uh, and I said, well, if I can squeeze you in tomorrow, can we make this work? And she did. So we, we were able to uh, uh, slow her down long enough to talk for a bit. I was, I was really impressed with her book. As she said, it's the third in the series of um, uh, the history of beekeeping, modern bee beekeeping, and the future of beekeeping in America. She did. She's done great work with uh, reclamation in her state and getting that information to beekeepers to be able to use to the maximum. Being a state That's apiary good. inspector as a woman is, uh, I've got to believe, somewhat of a challenge. But she seems yeah. to be making that work. Uh, yeah. Her and I go back to what did we say? 2002. So we're looking at 17, 18 years. So um, good. it's good to have watched her grow from a English English literature major to a major player in the beekeeping industry. So we're glad she could be here today. Yeah, I am too. And you know, I know we had talked about having her on to talk about the history of bees in America, and because that's currently the book I'm reading. And I thought there's a lot of creep information uh, 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 in that book that is either uh, that she documents that we've either heard through, you know, the grapevine or through stories telling, um, but to hear it and read it and have it documented or uh, is, is really, um, I found fascinating and as well as it kind of topical in today's, in many today's discussions when we're talking about native bee versus the honey bee, et cetera. So, 
Um, she's right on the bleeding edge of things. Uh, it's fun having her on today. So it was a good, good discussion. It was good. Good. I'm glad we didn't catch you too much by surprise. <laughs> no, it's always good. I like surprises. This is a good thing. All right. Well, thanks, Kim. Well, that about wraps it up with the, today's podcast with Dr. Tammy Horn Potter. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. In fact, Kim, did you know we've been rated the number three beekeeping podcast? I didn't know there were three of us, so we, we've got to work harder and get to that top spot. <laughs> Come on. Goal for us, Jeff. That does, it does. We got something to do in our second year. So yep. we want to thank this, this episode's sponsors. We have two of them, Global Patties and Wickwash Press. Visit Global Patties at www.globalpatties.com and Wickwash Press at www.wickwash.com. And that's W-I-C-W-A-S.com. And while you're browsing their websites and placing your orders, please give them a shout out for sponsoring Beekeeping Today podcast. And finally, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us your comments and questions at questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Anything else, Kim? I think that wraps it up, Jeff. I'm heading to the fair. You know, I got I got fair duty this week. I got fair duty tomorrow. So, uh, uh, of course, different fairs. But uh, we'll, we'll be seeing everybody at the fairs this weekend. There you are. We'll catch you next time. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye.